I'm Alec Baldwin, and you're listening to Marketing Trends and the Leeds Art Week. Data, data, data. In 2021, it's all you hear about, especially if you're a marketer. Whether you are taking calculated risks to ensure campaigns are rooted in what the data is telling you, or conducting massive rebranding campaigns, just about all of your activities are rooted in analyzing the numbers. But data these days is more than just numbers and graphs on a spreadsheet. It comes in all shapes and sizes and can be used to build a valuable connection between brands and consumers. And that's where Lisa Giacosa comes in. What gets exciting when you're on the agency side is that you can look at understanding a consumer's entire spectrum across multiple touch points, across multiple products and services, and start to stitch those journeys together and think about alliances and ways that you can bring things together. We've been able to go to our clients and say, we know that we can measure this correctly and we know that we can get this to a point where we can give you a guaranteed outcome against what's going to happen to your business. Lisa is the president and global head of data, technology, analytics, and insights at Spark Foundry, a global media agency that's all about bringing the heat to brands by driving higher engagement, affinity, and transactions. Lisa helps make that happen by guiding brands to take calculated risks through the power of data strategy and technology. On this episode of Marketing Trends, Lisa details what that looks like, and she goes deep in one particular area that is on the cusp in the marketing world, TV attribution. Enjoy this episode. Marketing Trends Podcast is brought to you by Salesforce. We bring marketing and engagement together. Learn more at salesforce.com slash marketing. Welcome to Marketing Trends. I'm Ian Faison, host of Marketing Trends. And today we are joined by a special guest, Lisa. How are you? I'm great, thank you. How are you doing? Doing well. Excited to chat with you today. So let's get into it. How did you get started in marketing? Well, funny enough, I, I started out thinking I was going to be a pharmacist in France. I uh, was studying chemistry and physics and all kinds of things at school. And then um, I decided to pick up a couple of extra subjects. And I picked up economics and business studies back in the day, back in the um, late, late 80s, early 90s. I forget how old I am. And um, the, the Black Wednesday happened and I was absolutely fascinated by the economics economics of what was happening. Fast forward to then looking at going to university and I was I was torn between, I knew I wanted to do languages and I knew I wanted to do something um, that was, you know, international. And um, I applied for multiple different types of things. And I, and I looked at, you know, linguistics, I looked at all this different stuff. And then I found this course at Bournemouth University in the UK it was international marketing management. It seemed to bring everything that really intrigued me together. So it was economics, it was accounting, it was business, it was marketing, it was media, it was advertising, and it was languages together. And I just saw it as an amazing opportunity to really hit the ground running and really learn around marketing. That took me all across the world in terms of, um, it was an international um, degree. And I, got, I was very fortunate that I got to work at a publisher back in the 90s and work in Japan and um, also France and Germany and Belgium. Um, they basically sent me out as a marketing rep across the world. And as I started to do that, I really started to hone in and focus on media. And that was a place I really wanted to get into as part of the marketing mix. And that's really what kicked me into the marketing space uh, in terms of, you know, really choosing the, the right degree and getting out there and starting to learn about the field and, and really finding it very interesting. Tell me a little bit about your current role. My current role um, is multifaceted. I am at Spark Foundry. I'm the president of data, technology, analytics, and insights, which means that um, I bring together all the power of all the data solutions that we use across all of our clients, understand the data strategy as well as the technology strategy that our clients needs to do, needs to get to in terms of their stack, um, how to bake the best of all the different platforms that are out there understand human beings, using data to really connect it to creativity and humans. And then of course, closing the loop in terms of analytics and measurement and getting to those true insights to get to driving impacts for our clients' businesses. Alongside that, I'm also executive sponsor on a number of different um, clients that we have. Um, so I really get into the nitty gritty of those particular clients and under the hood on their businesses. 
And also I work on our culture and DEI initiatives as well. Awesome. And so, yeah, what, what types of companies uh, do you all traditionally work with? Uh, you know, obviously AI data and analytics are at the forefront of what every single marketer is thinking about right now. Um, and it's a need that, uh, that everybody has. We are really fortunate at Spark Foundry. We have a multitude of clients across multiple fields, be that finance, be that CPG, um, you know, retail. We really do run the gamut across, you know, whether that's entertainment and leisure, technology. We, we have a whole spectrum of clients and it's, it keeps it super interesting. And it certainly keeps me on my toes as well in terms of truly getting under the hood of many, many different types of categories and understanding all of those businesses and trends and tying it together to deliver really good, really relevant experiences for consumers as well. Yeah, so I guess, you know, looking at this broadly, um, you know, I think, you know, data, technology, analytics, insights, all, you know, a lot of this stuff is is a little buzzwordy. Not that it actually is, it's just, you know, these are kind of thrown around a lot. Like I said, it's it's so important right now. I guess what's what's kind of the the, the state of the union here for how marketers should be thinking about uh, these things? The first thing I always say to my teams and to my clients is forget the jargon, right? If someone's going to come in and talk to you in three-letter acronyms and talk to you about all these different you know, types of technology and talk some jargon and can't articulate it to you in terms of how it's going to impact your business and how it's going to solve your business problems, then you've got a bigger problem on your hands, right? So the first thing I always say is let's get away from the jargon. Let's think about what that means for the consumer and what that means for the business and how it's going to drive that business impact. So moving away from whether it's a CDP or a DMP, we used to always joke in one of my previous jobs about the different number of acronyms you could get into one um, specific conversation and start to really talk about what it really means for uh, the consumer at large how we can actually influence them and make their daily lives better. And uh, then also think about how we can connect the dots in terms of understanding what's going to drive that most relevant experience, what's the value exchange for the consumer in terms of connecting with our brands, and then how does that actually impact the business? You know, where does the rubber hit the road? And we start to see the closed loop on metrics to get to understanding what are the levers and triggers that we need to optimize against in order to understand what's delivering on that business. Yeah, so what are some examples? And I know you can't share you know, exact specifics of, of who the customer and, and the client is and all that stuff, but what are some examples, uh, uh, anonymized examples of, of this stuff in practice? I get really nerdy excited when data unlocks an opportunity to, to identify a business problem versus just a marketing or media problem, right? So I'll give you a couple of examples um, from two different parts of my career and two different, very different um, organizations. One was um, I was working with a Latin America team and we were looking at um, this problem. We could not seem to work out why this media plan was not working for us. Why was our marketing not working for us in Latin America? And it was across a couple of different markets. It was Chile and Peru. And we could not work it out for the life of us that, the market mix and the econometrics kept coming back and saying that, you know, everything we thought was working should be working. But when we connected the dots back to the sales, even though the measurement we were doing was saying things were working, things were not flying off the shelves. And then, you know, crazily, we ended up going to the market, went into the market, went to the stores where this product was carried and realized that we had an, actually had a massive distribution problem, right? And so the merchandise was not getting to the shelf. So, you know, all that to be an anecdote to say, you know, you cannot market your way out of a distribution problem or a product problem, right? You, you, you can only market your way out of a marketing problem in, in terms of, you know, if, 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 if the product's not on the shelf, you can't make that happen. Fast forward to um, more recently, I was working with some data, similar sort of situation, except for it was a merchandising problem in this instance, where I was looking at all this data and I was looking at... Um, it was, again, a CPG category in this instance, looking at data around the, these audiences and specific markets, specific local markets in the US, and seeing that, you know, it just didn't make any sense. I could see my brand loyalty numbers. I could see that people were consuming the category, but I just couldn't get behind why we weren't shifting this particular product in, the, in these particular regions. 
So I sat with the marketing team of this CPG company and we, we went through all the data and we were able to diagnose that it was a merchandising problem that was occurring in store once again. So really interesting for me to look at from the, the ID level data I was looking at on a computer screen in New York was actually helping me diagnose a problem in Philadelphia that enabled me to then start to think about how to look at retailers differently and how to get that distribution working. So COVID-19 has changed us for maybe forever, but certainly for now, right? Yeah. And um, one of our clients um, came to us and they were having a crisis. They're a QSR client and they were having a crisis around one of the ingredients that um, was coming in. There was an issue uh, throughout this crisis of COVID. We've had all kinds of issues through from lack of potatoes to lack of beef to whatever it might be, right? And um, I remember desperately trying to get eggs myself at the beginning of the COVID crisis and not being able to get any at the supermarket. But what happened was um, we've been doing this market mix modeling for quite some time with this particular client. And it enabled us to look at not just, you know, the media factors of what will drive, you know, people to go in store or, or go into the, the, the franchise and order or do pickup or delivery. But we were also able to understand that if you've got a crisis and there's a particular ingredient missing, it doesn't always make sense to advertise without that ingredient. So, for example, um, you know, if there's a shortage on beef, that doesn't necessarily mean don't advertise beef because you've got much more chance of getting someone to come in and buy a beef burger versus, a, versus coming to buy a chicken burger. And so we were able to look at the dynamics of advertising beef versus chicken versus salad versus all those different kinds of um, ingredients and actual products to, to drive actual sales within the store. So one of the things that, that I thought was, was pretty fascinating is, is this idea of, you know, AI and some of these, uh, the, you know, machine learning and data and things like that are impacting, um, you know, TV potentially. TV is uh, attribution is, is super important. What are your thoughts on, you know, the way that, that TV attribution and data uh, and all of this is, is going to play into uh, how, how advertisers and, and companies think, think about using TV? That's multifaceted in terms of the change in behavior that we've seen over the course of the last year. Even the people you wouldn't expect starting to stream way, way more versus watching live TV. It's, it's, it's been an incredible behavioral shift in the last few years and particularly accelerated by um, COVID-19. As we start to think about um, measuring TV attribution, I still yearn, and, and, I, and I've talked about TV attribution a lot over the course of the years, but I still yearn for that, um, that notion of having one data source that will really work for multiple places in terms of TV attribution. I still find myself needing to stitch together multiple data sources to be able to build a picture of what is happening and what's happening across the, the marketplace. So we work with a multitude of different partners to get to that TV attribution. And of course, with cookies changing and IDFA and all the different various um, changes to the privacy laws, it's getting more and more interesting to stitch that back together in terms of how we get to marketing intelligence. So for me, it's around how you can isolate specific tests within specific data providers and then look at the multivariate of that and be able to bring it together to show a full picture so you can start to build that universe of connected TVs working together. Because the reality is on TV attribution right now, you cannot get a holistic picture with, with just one partner across the, the country. So we start to think about how we can stitch that data together, make sure that we unify it and then make the, the holistic picture across what's actually occurring against the business. Do you think that TV attribution is going to like be completely different in five years, 10 years? It really depends how we play out with the, the privacy laws, right? In terms of what's been happening in terms of CCPA and GDPR and all those different laws that have, have come into play. There was a notion at one point where I thought that, you know, we could have got all minority report and understood every single touch point and, and get to the right place and, and get to truly understanding all the right places to be in the right touch points. I don't think we'll get there based on the way that, um, where we've got to with, with consumer privacy. I do think though, we will start to see a shift 
as consumers start to understand what data privacy really means in terms of the value exchange and uh, how they're going to start to have to pay to consume more media and, and content, how they're going to have, how they will start to see things that are less relevant to them. I think that we'll start to see a bit of a pivot there as, as people lean into that value exchange. We've already started to see it happen in the UK where GDPR was brought in and automatically people started to opt into more things. We, we, started, we saw an initial decline in terms of the level of and then an increase, right? Yeah. So I think that as the public, you know, the, the consumers at large start to see more around the cost of privacy versus the cost of content and the cost of relevance and where their value exchanges sit, we'll start to see a, a, a different play, I think. So short story long, right, to get to, do I think it will look very different in the next five years? My hope is, yes, we will evolve and, and get to a, a better space. Certainly, as I look at some of the things that we have within our disposal at Publicis in terms of Epsilon and understanding people at a human and identity level without the, the, the need of cookies, that gets us to being able to close that loop and be much more relevant much more quickly. Um, and I think that consumers will almost hunger for more relevance versus not. I always talk to my husband about this because he's a mad fly fishing guy, right? Oh, yeah. Heck yeah. Me too. And he loves his fly fishing, but he also is one of those people, he hates advertising. And he hates opting into things and all that sort of stuff. And I, and I have, I've had some really serious conversations with him about, do you understand that you're going to have to start paying for that podcast now or paying for that content over there? Or indeed, you're going to start getting advertising for, for tampons instead of rods and reels, right? What would you prefer in terms of the relevance that you might get, right? So I think that, you know, as people start to see that things become less relevant, as marketeers start to see that they're getting to have a lot more wastage, I think we'll see people lean more to the ID solutions. And certainly, as I said before, you know, that's where our heartland is with Epsilon in terms of our ID solutions and being able to deliver that core ID, tie it to transaction data and understand who we're talking to as a person versus, um, you know, a mass, if you like. Yeah, can you take a step back and explain Epsilon because for our listeners who don't know? So Epsilon is a company that Publicis acquired around, it must be about a year and a half ago now, and they are born out of a mail marketing company. So ironically, where we've got to with data is exactly where data was several years, you know, 50 years ago in terms of, of mail marketing. And, and mail marketing obviously was predicated on name, address, and all that PII, right? Personally identifiable information. Um, I promise no acronyms, and there I go, right, with my acronyms. So, um, you know, and they mailed that personally identifiable information with transactional information, with understanding around behavior, and what we call non-PII, so non-personally identifiable information, to build a holistic picture around individuals and enable us to not only find those people, understand who they are and how they behave, but then also activate against it in terms of the environments that we can use in media to ensure that we deliver the most relevant messages. And so that's where we get to start to think about how Epsilon can fuel what we do at Spark a lot more by having many more data insights overlaid to all the traditional tools we have and then fueling that in activation. And again, because we have that transaction data for Epsilon, enables us to understand, did they actually have to go out and buy and, and close that loop on the measurement as well? well yeah. So, and, you know, working within, um, you know, a larger company, uh, you have publicists and obviously, um, you know, Spark Foundry being an agency within that. Is there particular, you know, things that, that you're able to, you know, see or have access to that are, that are interesting? I know you, You've kind of spent a bunch of time in your career on on a little bit on both sides of the table there, working for brands, then obviously working on the agency side, and and uh, I'm just curious, like how you kind of see the, you know, the brand side versus the agency side, and kind of having an advantageous position there, both with you know having a a company that has multiple assets, and then also um, you know based off your career. They're really, you know, I wish there were two of me and I would be doing two different paths in my career, right? There you go. I would have one going, the, the benefit of being on the corporate brand side, from my perspective, 
is that you um, are able to go 2,000 miles deep on a business and truly understand it. And so in my time at Kimberly Clark, I truly understood like things that you would never, you know, anticipate that the category that I was most passionate about, passionate about at Kimberly Clark was incontinence because I truly felt that those products that we had were truly helping people. And um, while we're at Kimberly Clark, while I was at Kimberly Clark, I worked on an amazing piece of, piece of work looking at behavioral science and understanding receptivity around understanding those signals that people give within their body language. We know that only 31% of what we say is the words we use, right? And for those of you that are at home, I'm flailing my hands around as I speak because I talk with my hands, right? And when you think about how someone responds to a question or a focus group, our CMO at the time used to call, call focus groups cupcakes because cupcakes are, you know, if you ask a kid, had, and he's talking about his daughter, if you, ask, if you ask his daughter what was in a cupcake, they would say 90% frosting, right? For the majority of people, if you made a cupcake with 90% frosting, you would hate it. And that's what we like in focus groups too at the time because, you know, if you go to a focus group and you ask a person a question, nine times out of 10 in a focus group for CPG, they're going to tell you they want it cheaper, they want it faster, they want better quality, right? Now, when you go in and talk about incontinence, it's a very, very personal subject. It's, you know, it, it's something that's, you know, debilitating in terms of like your lifestyle. And so if you ask a person a question about incontinence, they clam up, they don't want to answer, and their body language changes. And depending on who's with them in the room, they talk in a different way. Mm -hmm. Our behavioral science study enabled us to look at observing the body language and understanding the nuance and asking different types of questions to observe the behavior to get to understand the sentiment behind that. And that actually led us to a lot, a much different marketing approach than we would have done. It led us to different products. It led us to a lot, a lot of different product development as well as a marketing approach. Hence the 2,000 miles deep starting to really think about what do we need to do in terms of nu nuancing our products and truly understanding the need state for, for a particular product. And, you know, that then connects to supply chain and, and all of those sorts of flows. So it's, it's, it's 2,000 miles deep. On the agency side, it's not to say that we're not 2,000 miles deep. We're probably 1,500 miles deep, but we're looking a lot across a whole spectrum. And you look across a, a whole spectrum of industries as well. As I talked to you about Spark Boundaries clients, we have everything from beer to credit cards, from healthcare to fly fishing or outdoor retail, right? But we have coffee and we have burgers, right? Totally. So we, we have lots of things going on. And so for me, what gets exciting when you're on the agency side is that you can look at understanding a consumer's entire spectrum across multiple touch points, across multiple products and services and start to stitch those journeys together and think about alliances and ways that you can bring, bring things together. When it comes to Publicis, the Epsilon piece is super exciting to get to the data and the nitty gritty. That, that's something that really pushes my buttons in terms of understanding consumers, understanding those data touch points and understanding how we can close the loop. Also things like understanding how we can go to market throughout COVID, um, we've been able to go to our clients and say, we know that we can measure this correctly and we know that we can get this to a point where we can give you a guarantee, a guaranteed outcome against what's going to happen for your business, which has helped a lot of our clients to get to a different space during COVID and, and be able to get those guaranteed outcomes and have the confidence to keep moving in the market. Did you have any um, favorite campaigns that you worked on when you were... Uh when you were on the brand side? Lots, <laughs> lots. Um, I think that the, um, the work on Kleenex and the work on Surprise Depend, the Incontinence brand, I truly loved the way that we flipped the script on um, the, the Incontinence category. Um, I think, you know, the notion of giving back life and people, you know, gaining the opportunity to be able to go and go to the football game and, uh, and watch their grandchild play football or get dancing again with their friends. And, and um, that whole notion around Depend was, was groundbreaking for the category because the category was very much about, you know, 
you can still dance and laugh and all that sort of stuff. But I think with, with, with the pen, what we did is we started to say, you know, what will you get back when you, when you put on the pen? You know, it's about getting life back and recognizing the problem versus the happy clappy, let's go dance in aerobics class because everything's okay. Because you know what? When you've got inconstance, it's not okay. Yeah. With Kleenex, um, what I loved was, you know, the, the business problem for Kleenex is that, you know, around 50% of the time, when you need a Kleenex, it's not within reach. And so it's a different problem. Isn't that the truth? Goodness gracious. I need one. I need one in my office. I'm sitting here right now. I mean, I don't need a Kleenex per se, but uh, I always am in that need. It's allergy season. I'm with you. Yeah. And so um, there was also this notion of this human insight around the act of giving a Kleenex. It's actually a really notion, a notion of caring and giving, right? So sh sharing that love and, and sharing the care. And, um, you know, through that insight, we were able to get to some really great work that enabled us to share the care and think about moments of when you give a Kleenex, you know, if you see someone on the street and you give them a Kleenex, it's that notion of, oh my goodness, that's such a nice feeling, right? So I really enjoyed that work. I also enjoyed a lot of the, the data that we used to, not the typical data that you would go to for a Kleenex, so the obvious thing to do is, you know, as you said, allergy season or flu season and you dial it up, right? But there's a notion of with Kleenex as well, you know, if you're going to have a happy cry or a moment of emotion, there, there's all of those sorts of things. So we worked at the time with uh, the Weather Channel and we looked at the way that, you know, if, if you're a Chicagoan and it's 40 degrees outside, it's like shorts and t-shirt weather. I'm happy, right? Yep. If you were in Miami, it's 40 degrees outside. There's a different emotion there. You're like not in your happy place. And so we used a lot of those indicators to not just look at, um, you know, cold and flu, but also emotion as well and how it made people feel. And driving that emotional connection to build brand bonds really built out a, a success story for the brand. I love those examples. Wow, those are those are fantastic. And I like how, you know, using that's how you can use data to really to really showcase. Like you had mentioned earlier, if you're if you're asking people in a focus group questions and you just rely on what they say, like if you just had a transcript, right? It's like that's actually not the data that you need. What you need is the whatever the video footage or the behavioral, uh, you know, understanding to know that, Hey, this makes them feel comfortable or, you know, this type of thing. I mean, I think we just generally, you know, with fo focus groups now, I think there's a lot of, you know, a lot of stuff right now is, you know, rethinking focus groups, rethinking data of, of how to, how to not need focus groups, but that's a great, those are great reasons how you can get business insights and information and data points from things that historically, you know, would have been a difficult way to do that and, and really create campaigns around it. Yeah, I, I think really truly, truly understanding and using data to understand a human being holistically as a whole person really does get you to that emotional connection. And, and emotion is what really triggers the, the response in the brain. When you think about behavioral science and how your brain really works, a lot of the time you, you look around your house at, at some of the stuff you've bought, right? And you don't know why you chose that lamp really, or that particular type of soda or coffee. It, it's a lot to do with the semiotics of, of, of what's happened around how you make your decisions, right? And a lot of it is, is that emotional connection. You know, think about it, toilet roll. You know, if you don't make an emotional bond, there is no reason to buy Charmin versus Cottonelle. You have to think about that emotional bond and how you connect with that brand, right? Because we do all, like it or not, most of us do care about which brand of toilet paper we have. We can have full scale arguments in my house if it's not the right brand, right? Yeah, I need to go. I need to go uh, to the store um, this afternoon to get more. Uh, we're almost out. We're down to three rolls. Uh, but you know, it's funny because of you know all the COVID stuff and and. Um, and toilet paper being out right and left and having to deal with uh, whatever is available. Um, and, uh, you know, it is funny when you start to see, you know, that brand loyalty put to the test. Exactly. It's fascinating. Okay. So, you know, we've talked, we've talked data and, and I really like, you know, getting into the nitty gritty of like how to use data because, you know, it is a buzzword. It is, you know, jargon. It is one of these things that, that we talk about. 
when you're talking to someone who would like to figure out more ways to leverage data in their marketing, what is that conversation like? Like, what is the the CMO or marketing leader or brand leader that's coming to you and saying, you know, hey, Lisa, I just, I need to do a better job, but I don't know what I should be doing. I don't know what I don't know. I would start with, what's the business problem you're trying to solve first? Because that would dictate your approach in the data landscape. It will dictate the type of data you need to look for and whether you need to then start to think about building that out with some additional data sources or even, um, you know, surveys or panels or something of that nature. I think everybody needs to use data, but I think starting with the how should I use data versus the business problem or the marketing problem you're trying to solve first, ask the right questions and, um, you know, you'll, you'll find the right answers and the right data to get to to, the, to answer those questions. But I think sometimes... I've seen marketeers get carried away with, I need this new shiny technical stack versus um, what question am I trying to answer? And and I've seen that across a portfolio of my clients too, where they've invested super heavily into a technological stack that, you know, will work really well for them ultimately. But in terms of their data and digital maturity, they may have over-invested too soon versus understanding what problem they're trying to solve first. And, you, I always talk to clients around, let's not go for the run straight away. Let's look at crawl, walk, and run. What are we trying to answer? Can we do what we've already got? Can we enhance it in any way to get us to that walk? And then let's run with the full stack versus let's buy, you know, the Bugatti of, of technological stacks. So we've got all the bells and whistles ready to go when actually we're probably going to only activate against 10% of it. Let's, you know, prove out, the, the question we need to answer, solve that initial problem and then enhance it along the way versus over-investing at the very start. I think I've seen a lot of clients run into issues when they've over-invested in technology too early. Now, I've also seen clients go too slow, right? And I see some clients paying catch-up. In some cases, that catch-up day now means that you can leapfrog. For those that jumped into DMPs, again, I apologize for the jargon, data management platforms very early on, we're now seeing that really the next notion is to go to a CDP, right? And start thinking about how you harmonize first and second party and third party data together in your own home, in your own stack. And so, you know, there's an advantage at the moment for the people that didn't invest heavily in DMPs to now leapfrog to the CDP. And I, I, I would also say it's never too late to catch up. You know, there's always, an, there's always an innovative strategy you can take with how quickly everything evolves. There are ways to leapfrog and, and move yourself forward. Okay, before we get into our lighting round here, I want to get into like how you think about marketing for Spark Foundry. So obviously, you know, being a full service agency and being attached to such a large company is very unique, but how do you think about, you know, bringing new, new clients uh, to the organization? So marketing Spark Foundry, the company versus marketing for on behalf of our clients. Yeah, exactly, yeah. One of my favorite subjects, because I love talking about um, uh, Spark Foundry and how we are differentiated versus the market. Okay, so so when I start to think about Spark, I I get really excited about talking about Spark Foundry because I do feel that Spark Foundry is very much differentiated versus the market. And it's because of the way that Spark Foundry grew, right? Spark Foundry started out as a smaller, more scrappy startup nature type uh, of an agency. It was the smallest of the uh, publicist network within the SMG suite of of agencies at the time. What's really exciting from a Spark Foundry perspective is that that scrappy startup spirit hasn't gone away, even though we're now super large, right? And we talk about, to our clients and our prospective clients, we talk about Spark Foundry being that notion of the spirit of a startup with the soul of a powerhouse, the powerhouse of Publicis' clout behind us. So we can still afford as Spark Foundry to be very scrappy, very entrepreneurial, 
have that. We talk about bringing our heat because we bring our we bring heat to brands um, and, and having that startup spirit and having the comfort and the knowledge that we have the powerhouse of publicists behind us in terms of that clout in the marketplace, as well as all the things like Epsilon and, and all the data um, that, that we need. In addition to that, I said we bring heat to brands. Heat is not just this notion of spark. It also stands for something, right? It's, it's the notion of we bring higher engagement, affinity, and transactions for all the brands with which we work. And the reason I think that's important is it connects the dots of what we need to think about as we build brands and as we drive business. Because you cannot have a brand that's going to be successful if you don't have engagement in terms of people wanting to be in, in a conversation, for want of a better word, with you. You have to have brand affinity and brand affinity moves super fast. I'll tell you a different story later on that. But brand affinity moves super fast. And so you have to have that engagement, that affinity. And then the transactions, of course, is where the business metrics come in, in terms of the business impact. And so as I think about Spark, I, I see us, um, you know, very differentiated, able to do everything that every other media agency can do and more because of how we think about brands and how we have the entrepreneurial spirit as well as that clout. So then for your, like, do you have an outbound marketing strategy? Do you have like a way that you think about doing like a blend of paid marketing and things like that? Like, how do you think about your, your marketing uh, strategy and, and tactics? Well, as Spark Foundry, we tend to invest in our clients versus ourselves, first and foremost. Mm -hmm. That's the reality. Hashtag cheesy, right? But it's true. We do have a marketing strategy. Um, we have a CMO, uh, goes by the name of Scott Hess, and he is a very, very innovative. And we um, really focus on what it means to be Spark. So we have a number of different Spark values, for example, this is part of marketing, what I'm doing with you right now, right, is, is understanding how we can get the brand out there. But also, um, you know, we participate with a number of different industry associations. We're very passionate. Um, we, we have Spark Serves is one of our initiatives that enables us to do corporate social responsibility. When it's not COVID, we get out and we spend days of the year um, painting old people's homes, digging gardens, building habitats for humanity. We do lots of different initiatives like that. Since COVID, we pivoted slightly and we partnered with um, Givesley. And what we do is we do a whole suite of activities throughout the year. Something I found personally really, really rewarding is working with underprivileged schools. Um, we worked with NYC Play to be able to deliver education across school girls in the New York area in public schools to help them think about how they can be empowered as female leaders. We also did an activity with Stoot Up where we helped younger students to understand what it's like to get out an interview in the, um, in the world at large. So that spark serves, that's part of our brand and part of our ethos is that, you know, we within our culture are very much about giving back. We're also a very anti-racist company um, and we have a lot of DEI diversity, equity, inclusion um, initiatives as well. And of course, you know, getting out there and speaking to people like you, speaking at different events. Um, we, we participate in CES and um, South by Southwest and um, ensure that we get out into the spaces where our potential clients are and, and, you know, look at how we can help them achieve their business goals. Awesome. So you've developed a tool to develop brand equity. Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So um, this goes back to when I was working in a different place, but we saw a crisis with a particular brand, I won't mention which brand, um, where someone tweeted about the brand. And um, before we knew it, as it is in today's world, there was a tweet about the brand and, and within 24 hours, it was a global crisis. We'd shaved off, we, we'd lost a lot of money <laughs> on this particular brand because there was a belief that there was something wrong with the product. Now, when I looked at the time at the brand equity studies that, that we were looking at, they, they were done every year. We had this major crisis in, let's say, September through to January the following year. And I know that we lost multi-million dollars of share in the marketplace, 
But if you just looked at those brand studies from one year to the next, August to August, nothing happened. Oh, that's crazy. And the reality is, is that with the with with social media moving so fast, with the notion of cancel culture, with the notion of everybody has an opinion on everything these days, the reality is that brand equity can be impacted much more quickly than they than it's been traditionally measured. So in partnership with my wonderful DTI team at Spark, um, we developed a study that enables us to look at brand equity much more efficiently, much more rapidly in near to real time. It's called Flare, and it enables us to be able to go into market very quickly and understand have we seen brand metrics shift? Has brand equity dipped, changed in any way across a number of different attributes? And we can buy that programmatically against an audience and understand general population. Or we could even say, we only want to look at this particular section of the, the population to see, did that particular issue that was a crisis that happened in this particular region have an impact locally or globally or even regionally or nationally? So it's, it's, it's a study that enables us to be very, very rapid in terms of response, understand um, how brand equity is moving at that fast pace. And it enables us to get very, very efficient, very quick answers for our clients versus waiting quarter to quarter or year to year. Because by the time you're a year later, it's too late to make any moves or, or, or design any strategy to recover. That's fascinating. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. And I think that that is the speed in which, you know, we do things. Some things are, are forgotten, you know, more quickly with everything going on, but also other things are just, you know, it's pretty easy to just hit unsubscribe to say, okay, well, that's it. I'm out on this brand, you know, stop your Amazon delivery, stop your, uh, you know, whatever it is, or, or your CEO says, hey, you know, we're not using the supplier anymore. Okay, let's get to our lightning round. These questions are fast and easy, just like marketing with Salesforce. You can go to salesforce.com slash marketing to learn more about marketing on the world's number one CRM. That is Salesforce lightning round questions. Lisa, are you ready? I think so. Number one. What's the longest race you've ever been on? Running? Yeah. 15K. What is your favorite thing to do in New York City? Walk in Central Park. What is the city that you're going to run and visit as soon as uh, all the stipulations are lifted here? Can I have two? I would say go and see my family in Bristol and England, but go and see my best friend and my happy place, Pride of Luge in Portugal. Do you have a favorite book or podcast or TV show that you've been binging recently? Ooh, Smartless with Jason Bateman and the gang um, is awesome. Um, and Scott, anything Scott Galloway does. If you weren't in marketing, what do you think you'd be doing? I'd be a teacher. Best advice for a first time head of marketing? Don't stand still. Do things differently. Fail fast. Learn fast. Move forward. I love it. Lisa, this is awesome. Thanks again for joining. We really appreciate it. Everybody, uh, you can check out Spark Foundry. We'll link it up in the show notes. Any final thoughts? Anything to plug? Listen, if you're looking for an amazing agency, Spark Foundry is um, the spirit of a startup, soul of a powerhouse, and reach out. Awesome. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you. Marketing Trends Podcast is brought to you by Salesforce. Discover marketing built on the world's number one CRM, Salesforce. Put your customer at the center of every interaction. Automate engagement with each customer and build your marketing strategy around the entire customer journey. Salesforce, we bring marketing and engagement together. Learn more at salesforce.com slash marketing.